In this online lecture, we're going to look at two styles of art, abstract expressionism and pop art. These two styles are dating to the 1950s and the 1960s, and as you'll come to see, even though they are so close chronologically, they're very different both visually and ideologically. Now last time we were together, we were looking at American art, and we saw that prior to the Second World War, the majority of art that was produced in America was rather traditional. These styles focused more on a realistic approach and they were addressing subject matter that was uh, fairly American in its context. However, there are some significant changes that come with the onset of the Second World War. First of all, European artists are fleeing the violence and persecution that's part of the war. And this causes the center of the art world to relocate to America, more specifically New York. So prior to this, the center of the art world was Paris. This was where all of the really exciting and avant-garde developments were happening in the art world, Paris. And then with um, all of these artists leaving, this center shifts to New York. Now what's important to keep in mind is that when these artists come to New York, they're not just simply showing up and then, you know, creating artwork and, and that sort of thing. What they're also doing, which is really important, is they're starting to take faculty positions in a lot of American art schools. So they're also teaching young artists about many of these principles of um, abstraction and other avant-garde techniques as well. And that's gonna fundamentally change the character of American art. American artists, they were quickly influenced by this avant-garde spirit. And from this, we have, and this is very exciting, the emergence of the first major avant-garde movement in the United States, and that is Abstract Expressionism. Abstract Expressionism is also known as New York School, which is essentially referencing um, that this style is attributed to coming out of New York, but we'll keep it at abstract expressionism. Now, what had happened was the war had brought about to most Americans this very deep moral, political, spiritual, and economic crisis. American artists, and therefore also the American public, very open and maybe even desperate for a new style and a new mode of expression, and this explains even though why when we were looking at earlier American um, art and we were looking at the effects of the Armory Show, at that point there was really a tentative adoption of these more experimental modes to art making. But with this new modern world that had been irrevocably changed by war, people were interested in something new. They felt like realism might not be the most effective vehicle to communicate these really complex feelings that this war was bringing about in the American culture. I have a chart for you on the screen. This is showing us the evolution, the stylistic evolution of abstract expressionism. Where does the style come from? Where are the origins? What are the influences? And you can see that we've got Dada and Surrealism. Now a question for you. Based on what you know, dot on surrealism. Can you guess, can you perhaps predict what the foundational style would be for abstract expressionism? Think about what you know about Dada. Think about what you know about surrealism. Think about what you know about the foundational styles. Romanticism, right? This idea of the personal this idea of the uh, intuitive, the imaginative. Surrealism should have really big your big hint right in here. Now we know that uh, surrealism grew directly from Dada, and now we have it informing some of the ideas of abstract expressionism. Two arrows, because there's two things that we want to be thinking about here in terms of the link. Now in both instances, surrealism and abstract expressionism, the goal of the style is to express personal experience. Okay, hence we have as the foundational style romanticism. Now there's a little bit of a different nuance in terms of how these styles understand what the personal experience entails. For the surrealists, and we know this, they look at the subconscious, how the subconscious reflects the personal experience. Now for abstract expressionism, it's a little bit different. It's a little bit more general, actually. 
they're more looking at the emotional personal experience rather than the subconscious. Look at the name here, abstract expressionism. We know this name expressionism because we've looked at European expressionist styles, the Fauves, De Bruca, Der Blau Reiter. The idea was to express personal experience and emotion, particularly as it relates to somebody just trying to navigate the complexities of the modern experience. And essentially this word abstract means that we're going to be looking at very abstract and even non-representational approaches to this expression of emotion. So the personal experience is uh, analyzed through a little bit of a different lens in the art of these two different styles. The subconscious versus a more general emotional experience. Now our other link, our other arrow, has to do with process. The process that links is chance. So with the Surrealists, we know that they looked to these automatic processes of art making and they did so because they were trying to just like let whatever happens happens with the idea that this somehow brings out the subconscious, that when you set aside the rational thought and um, you know techniques of art making that you've been taught, when you just let whatever it is that's going to come out happen, that that actually is the subconscious speaking. Now, um, this is something that the uh, abstract expressionists work with as well, this concept of chance. It's just a little bit different. Again, it's more just bringing out emotion rather than some sort of deeper thoughts and psyches and all of that, that business. So chance as well as uh, the personal experience. Now, we have two different types of abstract expressionism. And you are definitely going to want to know these for your final exam. We've got gestural or, or action painting abstract expressionism. And then we also have color fields. And we'll look at these more specifically when we look at the imagery. Now I have one more thing to talk about, one more point of context before we begin to look at art. And that is good old Clement Greenberg. You really cannot talk about the uh, development of abstract expressionism without mentioning Clement Greenberg. He was an absolutely fundamental figure in the style. Who he was was he was a very, very powerful art critic and a very vocal one in what he thought made uh, effective modern art that was contributing to the overall growth or progression of art as it moved through the modern period. His writings essentially established this set of rules, and you know how I feel about rules, set of rules that really guides the trajectory of the style. Now he calls this a law of modernism. Now already this language should be raising some red flags. What does this mean, a law, right? Laws are rules, but laws are also compulsory. We have to follow them. That's a problem. What about this idea that if you don't follow a law, what happens? You get punished. That's a problem. And in many ways, that actually did happen. Clement Greenberg was so, so powerful that he did have the um, ability to make or break an artist. If Clement Greenberg said that your work was good, you're now a superstar famous artist. And if he doesn't like your work, he could potentially ruin your entire career. So um, he did have that level of power and he did in many ways enact his theories as this uh, kind of idea of a law. Now let's talk about what his theories entail. And it's extremely complicated. I'm not even going into the complexities. I'm just going to pick a couple of ideas that I think will give you the sense not only of what Clement Greenberg's all about, but really what the values are regarding the style of abstract expressionism and Americans' understanding of what modern art was as articulated by people like Clement Greenberg. Now what, he, what he's really encouraging is he's encouraging painters to reject everything about painting but the essential components of the medium. The essential components. What does that even mean, right? Now this is where we're getting to theory, this is where things get kind of abstract and sort of murky. What he's meaning is this, what is it about painting that makes painting a painting? Then the answer to this question is what's most essential to the medium? Well, if you compare a painting to sculpture, if you compare it to architecture, what makes painting a painting 
is that it's flat. So this is one thing he's really promoting is this idea of flatness, that that's what makes a painting unique is flat. So how does that work? Well, what that means and is a painter does not want to use things like perspective, right, which we know is that way of implying depth, a recession of space. Don't use perspective. Don't use modeling, all of these um, you know, techniques that imply a fully rounded three-dimensional form. The reason why you don't want to put these in your paintings is because you're now implying three-dimensionality, and that is not an essential of painting, but rather an essential of sculpture or architecture. So flatness is something that he's really focused on. He wants to celebrate the nature of painting, and that is inherently flat. Now, the other thing that he is talking about is he is also talking about this progression towards purity, which is making up what is called a formalist approach. Now, be careful with this word formalism because we may have heard this before. There's also an, a methodology that we've been working with, formalist, um, you know, formalism. And so it, there's, you know, formalism or formal analysis, but then there's also this Greenbergian formalism. They're two different things but not necessarily completely unrelated. When you look at these um, abstract expressions artworks, you will see that the most effective methodology that you can use really, I wouldn't say the most, but a very effective methodology is formal analysis. So they're linked, but there's a little bit more of an intellectual and theoretical heft behind Greenbergian formalism, and it's this progression towards purity. So another thing, so we know that he's all about flatness, Another thing, and we put this in under the formalist approach, is he argues that art first and foremost needs to be a, an, an optical experience, right? That what is most important is how you feel, what you register mentally, what you register visually when you look at a work of art. And so if you have subject matter, if you have representation in there, that that's going to undermine the purity of the work. It's going to take away from the optical experience because instead of seeing and you know having those experiences based on sight, the mind kicks in and you're thinking, you're interpreting, and now you've kind of gone off in this direction that Greenberg doesn't want you to go off on. So he no, says no representation, and he says that art first and foremost needs to be an optical experience, and these are the things that make effective modern art. Now I hope that you see that herein lies the problem with Greenbergian formalism. It's very narrow in its approach, and you have all of these theories really that are essentially based on Greenberg's personal tastes, which is highly subjective. Sorry, my alarm went off. It's highly subjective, right? And that's a problem. Because what's happening is, is that his theories don't do anything to contribute to the establishing of an objective framework. Something that other critics, artists, the public, even people like you and I, students, we don't have a lot there that we can use to really objectively judge or value or analyze the artwork. All right, let's take a look at abstract expressionism. We're going to start with Jackson Pollock. Jackson Pollock, he's probably the best known artist of abstract expressionism. His work is really well known to the extent where it's almost become emblematic, not simply of the style, but I would even say in some instances of modern art itself. Now, what, let's start with talking about the technique. Okay, this is really important, and it's so important I actually included a photograph of Jackson Pollock making a painting because of this technique. The technique is very non-traditional, and importantly, the technique is very expressive, right? And that's the name of the style. This is the idea is to express some things. So what's unique about Pollock's technique is the way that he works on the ground. So what he would do is he would take canvas and he would roll it out. And you can see the roll right here. He would not pre-cut the roll. So he was what happened is, is he's allowing the uh, painting in terms of scale to emerge on its own sort of organically as the painting is being made. And that's pretty expressive, and that is very much reliance on this idea of chance, right? No preconceived notions. 
Then he has this painting on the, the canvas on the floor and he physically gets onto the canvas. And then once he's on the canvas, he's dripping and he's splattering using paint brushes or sticks or whatever. Now this physical contact between the artist and the canvas is really important, also inherently expressive. There's an intimate physical relationship that is happening at that moment. And you can actually see it when you look at Pollock's work sometimes where you can see like portions of a handprint or a footprint or whatever. You see the physical interaction that has occurred between the artist and the artwork. When you have a work of art on a wall or on an easel in your painting, you there's a separation. The arm reaches across the space. The um, brush reaches across too. It touches the... Um, the canvas right but there's that physical separation here there's actual physical contact and that's something that's very important now the technique that we see here we refer to action painting this idea that he's moving he's moving around and then even that is seen as more expressive than simply standing there and just moving your wrist which is typically how painters would paint now, what makes him a gestural abstract expressionist, right? What does this mean, gestural? Gestural are the movements, the gesture that the artist makes when creating the work of art. His gestures are apparent. He doesn't blend or smooth them away. And so looking at the movement, having that being recorded in the, uh, in the artwork, also seen as expressive. The artist is here. This isn't like Grant Wood, who's amazing, but he blends all of his work, all of his brushwork, so you can't see where he was, how he moved to make the painting. And that is something that you can clearly see here. Now what happens is, is for these types of drip paintings that Jackson Pollock made, the end result was an all over or an afocal painting. What this means, afocal, is it means that there is no focal point. There's no one place where our eye is going to stop and rest. Our eye is continually moving um, around and around and around. Because of this uniform treatment of the surface, it makes for a painting that is inherently flat. Now here's my question to you. What do you think Clement Greenberg would say? Do you think that Clement Greenberg would like Pollock's work or hate it? If you think that he would like it, you would be correct. Not only did Clement Greenberg like Pollock's work, he loved Pollock's work. He was a huge fan of Jackson Pollock because this hit all of the criteria. Okay, First of all, a Jackson Pollock painting tends to be huge. And you can get that sense if you look at the photograph on the left. So imagine this like huge wall-sized painting and standing in front of it. You're dwarfed by this frenzy of line and of shape and of color right? And this is the point for Jackson Pollock. And this might be the one spot where Clement Greenberg and Jackson Pollock might part ways. For Jackson Pollock, this truly was an expression of emotion. Now, you've probably heard me talk about Pollock before and this idea that his biography does factor in. This person uh, was an alcoholic. He suffered from depression. He had a dysfunctional and tumultuous relationship with his wife, who, by the way, was a total boss of a painter, Lee Krasner. And so he felt that life very much was characterized by struggle and by angst. And so he gets onto the canvas. He moves and he drips and he splatters as a way to get all of that out, those feelings of anxiety and of angst. I think it's highly effective and I think that is right in line with what abstract, abstract expression is trying to, trying to do. Now here's my question though. Why do you think that, that Clement Greenberg wouldn't be super on board with this? I just told you that Clement Greenberg loves Pollock's work. Why wouldn't though he like the idea of him being so emotional and just saying like, oh my gosh, I struggle with life. All of these crazy lines everywhere show it. The reason for this is because, as you know, Clement Greenberg really privileges the optical experience, and that's the issue, is that you're kind of like now getting into like an emotional experience, expressing emotion, and for Clement Greenberg, he's more about this idea of, again, the optical. But Clement Greenberg still is on board with Pollock because Pollock is still creating the visual optical experience by making these big, by um, also rejecting representation, right? These are non-representational 
And finally, these are flat, right? This celebrates the essentials of the medium because of the all over treatment, the afocal treatment. We're not having differing planes of space. Everything is flat, everything's uniform, and therefore Clement Greenberg is on board. Let's talk about Willem de Kooning. Now he also is a gestural abstract expressionist, which I hope you can look at here and see that very clearly. Now for de Kooning, he also is a sort of action painter. And as with Pollock's work, process is very important. Now it took two years for de Kooning to make this painting. And according to de Kooning's wife, Elaine, who also was an amazing painter, and she's also an art historian, she said that the way that it worked is he would go into his studio each day and he would paint. And at the end of the session, he would come in and he would scrape away from the surface the paint that he had applied that day. Now, this is in part where the, the gesture comes in, the process. Think about the gesture of scraping. There's an intensity there, right? There's a kind of roughness, and so he's scraping away. And then he comes in the next day and he paints, and he scrapes away, and he paints, he scrapes away. And the, the, the painting, the, the gestures of applying the paint onto the canvas, as you can see here, they're very agitated. They're very, like, sweeping. They're rough, right? These are not just, like, happily applied brushwork. They're, they're certainly intense. So for two years, he scrapes away at this painting, and then for whatever reason, one day, this is what he decides on. Uh, he decides on what, to me, looks like a pretty creepy woman. Uh, again, kind of very roughly created through this sort of slashing, uh, intense brushwork. Now, uh, let's talk about this little creepy lady, right? She's kind of creeping me out. Something's creeping me out of these eyes. These eyes, maybe, have you seen this before? Long time ago in Art 200, right? Remember back to Mesopotamian sculpture. Remember back specifically to the Sumer early dynastic period. We have these figures with these disproportionately large eyes to symbolize eternal wakefulness. And some art historians say that it's Sumerian early dynastic sculpture that is influencing de Kooning to create these large creepy eyes. I think it's the teeth that kind of make me uncomfortable, as well as the fact that this person, this woman, looks like she has hooves. And uh, the reaction to this, the critical reaction, um, let's talk about this. The... Uh, the, the feminist art historians and critics, they're not exactly um, loving this painting. They're saying that it's a kind of violent approach to the representation, that it's not a very positive image of, um, of a woman. It just overall feels very negative, very violent, very creepy. It's not a work that by any means seems to be celebration, celebrating femininity. Now, de Kooning didn't really have a comeback to that. He just said that he's trying to um, inject a little bit of humor into his work. And uh, the feminist art historians aren't laughing. But what about Clement Greenberg, right? What does Clement Greenberg think about that? Well, what Clement Greenberg says is that, uh, well, what do you think? He thinks that it's not good. Why would Clement Greenberg not like de Kooning's paintings? Representation. Not only do we see representation, but we're also getting a sense of depth and a fully rounded, somewhat fully round, still a little flat, three-dimensional form. There's a little bit of implied three-dimensionality with both space and form, and we have representation. Now here's a little story for you. Um, when de Kooning was first making work, he did create um, non-representational work. It's kind of like black and white and kind of like slashy and stuff here. I think it's kind of whatever, but that's just my opinion. I do like this better, even though I do feel that there is something a little bit negative about the depiction of women. If I set that aside, I do like this work better. But anyways, and this is what he's better known for. Clement Greenberg went on this very public lecture tour where he toured all around and gave all these speeches, basically hating on de Kooning and saying that, um, you know, the work wasn't good now that it's representational. And um, 
you know, really uh, excoriated his work very publicly. And so um, after he did that, there was this time where de Kooning saw Greenberg at a restaurant and punched him in the face. So if you're feeling like Greenberg's kind of annoying you, know that somebody punched him in the face and maybe that'll make you feel better. Mark Rothko. We're moving on now to color field. And uh, this is a descriptive term, color field. Fields are large areas of color. Now the difference between gestural and color field abstraction is that the gestural uh, artists rely on gesture. They rely on visible brushwork to enhance the um, expressionistic qualities of their work. For the color field painters, what they rely on is they rely on color. And we tend to see actually that gesture is blended away. We don't even really see it. Now, of course, there's exceptions, but this is the general rule that we can remember is they blend away the brushwork and really the focus is on color. I don't know, I feel like we've seen this before, this idea of color being used to express emotion. Oh, that's right, we saw that with European Expressionism. But I feel like we even have seen it before the European Expressionists. Where was that? Oh, that's right, we saw it with the uh, Post-Impressionists, essentially the ones that are um, coming with the emotional approach, people like Van Gogh and Gauguin. The legacy lives on. You know whose else's legacy is living on right now? Malevich, father of the squares, right? A thank you to Malevich for encouraging people to use the square in the uh, modern aesthetic. So a lot of things going on here. We do see some very clear art historical connections, but there's things that Rothko is doing that's new. These are beautiful squares. They're like hazy blended brushwork and they kind of like are floating in the the compositional space it gives it a sense of serenity a sense of of peace even though it is restrained this isn't like pollock in your face um drips and splatters everywhere and again it's the the color and the eloquence of this color communicated through these floating hazy squares that really has a responsibility of communicating uh, emotion this is what Rothko is known for. These tend to be large-scale paintings that have this meditative quality. There's a spirituality um, to them as well. And it's pretty typical. You've seen one Rothko, you've seen them all, where it's um, a rectangular orientation of the composition and then the stacking of three rectangles or three squares. Now he, you see the title number 61 with this sort of clarifier that's a description of color rest in blue. Rothko does not name his titles because he doesn't want to inform the viewer. I personally think this is beautiful. The idea is that it's a sort of meeting in the middle between the emotional response of the viewer and what the artist is trying to convey. So Rothko's trying to convey some emotions. We're going to look at this and he recognizes, I think in a very realistic way, that we might not feel the exact same emotions as he does. We meet in the middle in this way. How does the way I feel when I look at this interact with the way he felt when he painted it and that is the significance and that's where the meaning truly is arising in that that interaction it's a really beautiful thing so these really are intended to be these paintings that are expressing a human emotion on the more basic level I would say some it convey positive emotions some convey negative ones as well it's very very nice now this part's a little bit sad, um, and it, but I'm telling you this because it shows you really the way that these paintings were intended to be a reflection of Rothko's emotion. As time passes, these paintings become progressively darker, and he starts to use more grays and more blacks, um, and uh, it feels like the ideas and the emotions that he's trying to convey are becoming progressively gloomier and pessimistic. And uh, we think that this was indeed a reflection of Rothko's own emotional state as a sort of precursor because he does eventually commit suicide in 1970. All right, let's move on to Helen Frankenthaler. Helen Frankenthaler is wonderful. 
um, for so many reasons. One of the things that I really respect about Frankenthaler is that she developed a technique. And I think it's a technique that is very important. Uh, I think it's experimental and I think it is right up in there with the aims of the abstract expressionist style and this technique is soak stain. Now what she does with soak stain is she takes paint, she pours it onto the canvas. Now there is this level of chance right here because we don't know how it's going to pour out, we don't know how it's going to interact with the cloth. And she didn't either. Now she didn't just kind of like let it, oh whatever's happening, happen. She'd pour it on but there was some manipulation. She'd manipulate the movement of the paint with mops or squeegees or rags or you know whatever. The point is is when she would move away the, the paint, it would, it would basically what was left is a staining on the canvas. So this like Rothko is a removal of gesture. You don't see paint strokes or anything like that. It's just these stains of color, right? Which is perfect for color field. Now this is a unique technique in and of itself. So I just want to make that clear before I say this next part, which is that Frankenthaler was to some extent inspired by Pollock. She did her own thing, but she got her idea uh, in some ways from Pollock. What happened was Greenberg took Frankenthaler to Pollock's studio, and she saw that he rolled out the canvas, that he didn't pre-size the composition, and this idea of working on top of the, the canvas. And those were the things that inspired her. And so she did the same thing where she rolled it out, she didn't pre-cut it. Her works tend to be very large in scale, but her technique was different. Pollock is dripping and she is pouring or soak staining. Now, Here's my question for you, right? What do you think Clement Greenberg thinks about this? Clement Greenberg, he's loving it. Loving it. Why? Okay, so we know it's an optical experience. It's large in size. It's reliant on color. There's no representation, right? Now, the other thing is it's flat. Now, you might say, well, hmm, it doesn't feel flat because of this, right? But you want to know what this is? This is raw canvas. This is canvas that has not been gessoed or prepared in any way. It's canvas that doesn't have paint on it. This is huge. Greenberg loves this because not only is flatness an essential of painting, but canvases. There's no other medium that uses canvas. So she, in many, many, many ways, is even more so than all of these other abstract expressionists really embracing and celebrating the essentials of the medium. Now, in terms of Frankenthaler's contribution to art history, there's um, two points that art historians say are really, really important. One of the things that they say is that her work um, is organic, that there's um, these really um, kind of visually pleasing arrangements of color that some argue are a kind of step away from this more angsty um, existentialism that seems to come from the post-war period. That this is a sort of optimistic approach to abstract expressionism, maybe something not as intense and heavy as um, Pollock and de Kooning and even to some extent Rothko. The other thing is her approach is seen as being reductivist. It's reducing down the, um, the, the artwork to its physical properties, particularly in its um, celebration of the canvas. And some see this as this um, being influential to the minimalists, who we'll be talking about in the next lecture. All right, we're moving on to pop art, and you can see here, I hope immediately, that this is like pretty much night and day from abstract expressionism, and that actually is kind of the point. Let's talk about the um, what we've got going on here. Now, some people say, and I agree with this, that pop art in many ways is this very clear rejection of what's become this sort of intellectualism of the artistic culture. And we saw this, right? You got people like Greenberg coming in and flatness and progression towards purity and formalism. And it's, it's very intellectual. 
And it's very complicated, you know, with this non-objective, non-representational imagery, people don't quite understand it. They don't know how to interpret it. They don't know how to uh, really interact with the work in that way. Um, it's seen as being kind of um, elitist and kind of overly heroic in many ways a masculine sense. And that's not me. That is kind of the, the common... Thing that art historians say is that there is this sort of masculinity uh, that's being celebrated in a lot of these these paintings. Take out the masculinity part though and it is this idea of it being very heroic, very dramatic, very elitist and people didn't really they didn't really like that um, and again they didn't really understand it and so how do you sort of challenge that artistically you go in the absolute opposite direction and you make works of art that have vacuums in them right now there's another thing though this isn't just simply a reactionary style against the intellectualism of abstract expressionism this is a reflection of um, culture at the time and i argue that pop art really is a style of critique what happened was after the Second World War, consumerism was really being encouraged as a way to rebound financially, to raise up, um, you know, these economic systems to where they were prior to the war. So we are seeing this most often happening in England, and it's also happening in America as well. Now, when you think about pop art, a lot of people think about the pop artists like Andy Warhol and Lichtenstein, and these are American artists. I will point out, though, that pop art originally comes from England. We just don't really associate uh, pop art with England because the style does find better articulation in America. Now, what we're looking at here is we are looking at a style that um, is really focused on the everyday, right? And it's not just simply the everyday, but it's like the most banal, mundane fa aspects of the everyday, right? I'm vacuuming in a kitchen. You know, I'm cleaning my kid's nursery. I mean, you can't get more banal than this. Now, I talk about this idea of critique, right? That these images, the banal, the everyday, that this actually is a form of, the, of critique. And it's three facets of our culture that are being critiqued, okay? One mass culture and what this means mass culture is it's looking at things like um, newspaper television ways in which information is recorded to us right how do our cultural constructs uh, reach us right they reach us through these forms of communication also we look at um, popular culture what's popular who is popular at the time and what does that say about our culture and then finally, consumer culture. How do our purchasing practices reflect who we are as a culture? So mass culture, um, popular culture, consumer culture. Now this piece here, it's a psychological fact. Pleasure helps your disposition. It's by the artist Eduardo Paolozzi. He is affiliated with the independent group, which is not technically art, the pop art precursor. What happened is the independent group, they were in an, in an exhibit called This Is Tomorrow, and it was from this exhibit that the pop style emerged, right? So these are the people that grow directly into pop art. So even though these are not technically pop artists, um, it doesn't matter because they're doing the exact same thing that the pop artists will um, eventually embrace. Now, what we're looking at here okay is we're looking at this like two-part piece it's a diptych and what essentially the artist is saying and you get this from the title is that um you know what, what makes life fulfilling you know what makes uh life you know wonderful what contributes to psychological well-being oh i know what it is it's a hoover vacuum right it's a beautiful kitchen with all of the newest appliances i'm so happy cleaning up my kids nursery right um, and so it's this idea that um, all you need to do is purchase things and live this modern life and that'll make you happy and provide you with a sense of fulfillment. 
Now, what's ironic is that in terms of the source of this imagery, he's using advertisements. And um, he's taking these and he is, you know, placing them in there. And they're overly happy. They're almost saccharine in a way. No one is that happy vacuuming. I am sorry, but I am not accepting the reality of this image. Um, the happiness really is glaringly artificial. It's a false sense of happiness. And so this is this way that critique is operating. Now here's another one. This is Richard Hamilton. He's also a British artist. Just what is it that makes today's home so different and appealing? Let's talk about um, the, the materials, the, the medium here. So what we're seeing with both Paul Lotze's image and also from uh, the one we see here is the photo montage where and we saw this with Dada the artists are taking um, you know material from print culture magazines newspapers etc advertisements super potent and appropriate for this style and then integrating them into these collages right so collage is very very important to um, the pop art medium now here what we have is we have very recognizable imagery, right? And I like to use this um, photo montage because it has all three components of typical pop critique, consumer, mass, and popular culture. So what we have here is we have this sort of fantasy interior that is really reflecting the values of modern consumer culture. And it's investigating the same sort of idea as Paolo Lotzi's work, that the consumption of mass-produced objects, that popular entertainment can be the source of happiness and contentment. So what makes the modern person happy? Okay, well, first of all, let's talk about buying stuff, right? I'm super happy right now because I have a ham. I'm driving a Ford. Uh, another vacuum, right? What is with the vacuuming? Vacuuming making you happy, right? The Tootsie Pop. Now, of course, this is a whole sort of situation here, the way that it's placed. It's certainly phallic. Um, it might be this sort of double reference to this idea of pop, pop as a style and pop as it's relating to a uh, sort of phallic situation that we've got going on here. What makes us want to buy these objects? And this is where mass culture comes in. A newspaper, television, right? I'm super happy because I get to just sit around and watch television all day. And then whatever this thing is. And then finally, popular culture. What's popular at the time? So this is um, a bodybuilder, some Russian person. So that's popular at the time. This is actually from um, pornography. So this is where pornography is at, a lot different than the pornography of, pornography of today. And then romance comics are very popular as well. And so again, altogether, social commentary, one that really is calling into question the values of society. David Hockney. So David Hockney, I love this painting and this is because I'm from Southern California. So this is a landscape I'm familiar with. Southern California suburbia with the pool. Um, he was a British artist who had a home in Southern California, more specifically in Los Angeles. And so he painted these different depictions of the suburban landscape that in many ways were fantasy images of eternal sunshine with days spent by the pool. Which we spend some days by the pool, but not every day, all day. So he's right, there is a level of fantasy here. This pace here, a bigger splash, is one of the... It's probably the most well-known of the three paintings that he did of this series. And I think what's going on here is it's talking about this idea of, you know, material comfort, right, and an uncomplicated existence. That life is really simple, but also that it's very comfortable because you just get to sit around and swim all day in the pool, right? Now, a pool in many ways is um, a really important consumer object. First of all, it's at placed at the ultimate consumer object, which is your home. And the pool is expensive. I remember we had a pool growing up and you had to like have a pool guy come and you had to put chemicals in it and you had to keep it clean and you had to heat it and you had to fill it with water. Pool is definitely not free. 
And you know what it is as well as it's like the ultimate symbol of leisure, right? That you can just swim in this pool. And it really is the site of comfortable living and relaxation, right? And so we have this idea of how consumerism can really bring comfort and pleasure to somebody's daily life. Now there's the simplicity to the composition. Look at, let's do a little formal analysis. We have um, geometric shapes and analytical lines. We've got flat areas of color. Everything is very simple. It's clean and it's crisp. He uses a rich color to suggest the warmth of the, the atmosphere, right? This is exactly what we want to swim in in a warm summer day in Los Angeles. However, what I would argue is there's the same sort of critique and cautionary undertone that we were also seeing with both Hamilton and Paolo Zzi's work. Yeah, this is wonderful. This is a pool, the site of comfort and leisure. But there's a kind of like a stillness here that almost is making me a little uncomfortable. It's almost too quiet. And this idea that, yeah, I'm having fun, I'm swimming, it's leisure. But this idea is still being kind of like alone, right? That there's no one else around. You can't even see the person swimming in the pool. They're just kind of being suggested uh, with the splash that you see there. This painting is completely void uh, of human presence. And that's what we truly need as people, right, is, is each other. This idea that, you know, consumer objects really don't fill, fulfill you if you are by yourself, which I think is a good point. All right, Roy Lichtenstein. Now we're moving on to American art, which Hockney's piece is kind of in the middle. He's British, but he's making art in America. Lichtenstein is fully American. And what he's most famous for is he's most famous for using the, the comic book aesthetic. And he makes these like really melodramatic uh, paintings that look like comics. Now what's significant about Lichtenstein's work is he tends to work in large size. Now the reason why this is important, we've talked about this um, in this class, is this idea that scale indicates importance. And so traditionally in the history of art, these genre that we're seen as really important, like history paintings and, and the like, those would be really large in size to communicate how important that subject is. So you can kind of see what Lichtenstein's saying because he has this painting super large in size, so it's indicating its importance, but ironically, it's a comic book. And so what he's saying is that these um, more everyday images that are actually quite simple in their construction are actually quite significant. So, at the time, these melodramatic romance comics were extremely popular. So this is appropriate that he's using this. This is a reflection of popular culture. And again, it's very melodramatic. It's always this guy, Brad, that this lady's crying over. Brad, right? And so um, he really does not hide, though, the source of the imagery that it's comic. He works with primary colors, the most simple, straightforward. He's got red. He's got yellow. He's got blue. He uses these really thick lines to make the shapes and the form very, very clear. Everything's flat. It's not bended, blended. And what he's done, you can see it down in here, is he's come in and he's silk screened what are called bende dots. And these little dots are what are making it clear that we are looking at um, an image that has its origins in um, print media and Andy Warhol. We can't talk about pop art and not mention Andy Warhol. Now I wanted to bring in something different. Everybody has seen the typical Warhols, the Campbell Soup, the Marilyn Monroe. I like this one, Chairman Mao. Andy Warhol is considered to be probably the quintessential pop artist, and as he should be, he is well known for his silk screen printing technique. So what he did is he did paint, but he applied that paint using stencils. Now I'm pointing this out because this process actually was meant to in and in itself be a commentary. So his studio was called The Factory. Let's think about this and how that relates to mass production, but yet art is being produced. That's interesting. 
The other thing is, is he didn't really have a very active role in making these art, these artworks. He designed the stencils, but then he would give all of this to his studio assistants and they would make the art. And that was meant to be even a commentary on mass production as well. This idea of art, you know, is art unique? Is it only touched by the hand of the artist, right? When he's in a factory sort of churning this stuff out and not even touching it. So those are some interesting ideas that really made people question the unique value um, that they were subscribing on to art. And in many ways, art becomes this consumer object, which I think is also a very potent critique. Now, what Andy Warhol did is Andy Warhol um, would do a lot of these portraits of well-known uh, celebrities. He would do Marilyn Monroe, he did Jackie Onassis, he did Elvis. And what's important is he would take their their um, portraits just like what you're seeing on the screen and repeat them. Repetition was an extremely important part, a uh, very important design principle of, of Warhol's work. And it's this idea that when you repeat something, that image repeated begins to lose its significance because it becomes commonplace at this point where these people don't quite matter as much as human beings because they've become a commodity just a replicated image that we keep looking at and looking at and looking at now what happened was in 1972 there was a really significant political event that occurred prior to 1972 the united states did not recognize the communist government of china but what happened was uh, Henry Kissinger was able to, through this very fascinating and delicate dance, kind of maneuver things diplomatically so that the American government could recognize China and that it would not, um, you know, and that we could kind of go over there and uh, manage that recognition and not look like we were weak or taking a step back or anything like that. That it was a willing recognition. So what happened is in 1972, President Richard Nixon goes over there. And what happened was in preparation for this, the American media is like looking at China and they're looking at their leader, Chairman Mao. Who is this guy? And so the media does what we know even today the media does. And they just like harped on it. And so everything's like, who's Mao? Who's Mao? And he's all over the American media, which of course makes him now a target for Andy Warhol. So he creates this portrait of Mao that in many ways is the same as his Marilyn Monroe's and his Elvis's and his Jackie Onassis. He's really interested in the way that fame is constructed. What makes people famous? Why? Why are they famous? And he was the one that was coming up with this idea of 15 minutes of fame, which is totally true, right? This idea that for 15 minutes, you're all anyone can talk about, and then all of a sudden, um, you're gone forever, right? And so he made this piece to, to comment on that. Now, for me, though, it goes beyond this. And this is why I like this piece. I think this is there's some additional messaging here that's significant. If you relate this image to the actuality of Chairman Mao, and if you also relate this to how Chow, Chairman Mao used imagery, and actually there's a similarity there. So one of the things about Chairman Mao is he was like this propaganda machine. And everywhere, all over China, is this type of imagery. Chairman Mao is heroic and he cares about China and he's wonderful and he's amazing and the sun shines right from behind him, right? And even today, if you go to China, a lot of this Mao propaganda is still located publicly throughout the country. And it's interesting because what happens is, is we're again looking at this idea of repetition. Now what happens is, is with Chairman Mao, the repetition of his imagery is meant to be a representation of power, that everywhere you look, here is this guy who's so amazing and so wonderful. You seriously cannot forget about Chairman Mao when you were in China, I will tell you that even today. Now what's interesting is um, Warhol's doing essentially the same thing, where he's replicating the image. Now he's using though all of these different colors and it kind of almost makes Chairman Mao almost feminine in appearance, looks like he's wearing makeup. And it's interesting because what seems to be the case is it shows just how tenuous this notion of power can be. They're both doing the same things, this replication of imagery, but just with a slight shift of color. Warhol can subvert the sense of power uh, by making um, Mao look almost sort of flamboyant.